mom's gonna love this. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? She deserves it. She's a great mom. Okay. What are we missing? We got the eggs, the juice, the muffins, got the bacon, cereal, oatmeal. Dad, nobody likes oatmeal. Hey, I know we got chocolates for your mom, but there was something else that she wanted for Mother's Day. What was it? Was it a new Bible? Look how worn out that thing is. Dad, gotta start watching out for these things. I bet it was the spa day. I bet it was a new car. Uh, definitely not a new car. She's basically my personal Uber driver. We could both use the upgrade. <laughs> no. Was it those fuzzy socks? Dad, you get that for her every holiday. She has like a thousand of them. Is it one of those candles that she puts in our bedroom? Hold on. Why does she only put that on my side? What was it she wanted for Mother's Day? <laughs> oh. What's up, buddy? It's a slanty bin! <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> we clearly owe you brunch after church. <laughs> what you owe me is a nap. Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> there we go. Has anyone's Mother's Day ever started out like that? Does that look a little too familiar for some of you? Well, happy Mother's Day. Uh, welcome to Crossroads. My name is Alex. For those who don't know me or those online, I am the lead pastor here. And it is a complete joy to uh, share the message with you on Mother's Day. Um, as I share the message with you today, I want to invite you to open your Bibles and to read the scriptures with me along the way. We are continuing in a series called Sincerely God, a love letter. Today's message is titled, uh, The Bible is a Guide. Now, have you ever thought about who the greatest guide in your life is? I'm not talking about uh, like nature trail guides or health gurus. I'm talking about the one who was from the beginning, your emotional backbone. I'm talking about the one who provides the holding place for everyone's feelings and does their best to keep us from hurt. The one who has the power to heal wounds, both physical and emotional. The one who works hard and makes sacrifices, who forgives you when you make really bad mistakes and get eight concussions or set fireworks off in the backyard, who supports you when no one else will, who thinks you can do the impossible when everyone thinks you're a little off your rocker, who sets boundaries for you, like don't put the fork in the outlet. And even though at the time you're like, I don't like boundaries, shockingly, it made you a better person today. <laughs> this person sees and hears everything as though there's cameras all around, knows instinctively when bad things are coming your way and they warn you and will inevitably be there to pick up the pieces even after you do the complete opposite. The one whose smile warms the heart and makes your day a whole lot better. Who is this guide, you ask? Well, of course, it's moms. Moms, we should be so grateful for our moms, stepmoms, or mother figures in our life who embody so much of who God is. The role of the mother is to walk with her children and to guide them in the way of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says it like this. Deuteronomy 6, 7, will you read it with me? These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, I'm not saying all mothers are perfect or all mothers are out of this world amazing. I know for some of us, we have a really difficult relationship with our mom. Or we might have a difficult relationship with our kids. But perhaps you had someone in your life who was a mother figure. And we should give thanks to God for moms, stepmoms, mother figures in our life. 
We should honor them because moms are often our guides in life. They help us to navigate the physical and emotional and spiritual terrain. Think about this. When you have a small problem, who do you go to? Mom, right? Before AI or Google, um, we had access to the most incredible database known to humanity, mom, right? Mom, I can't tie my shoe. Mom, where's my phone? Mom, when's dinner? Mom, uh, can you tell me when my recital is? Mom, 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 why aren't you answering me? And if mom isn't around, perhaps you might ask a family member or a friend. You might even Google or AI it to try to figure out what's going on. Definitely the last result is to ask dad. Maybe I'll, <laughs> there we go. You might be better off skipping it all together, I'm just saying. Because if you ask a family or friend, you don't know what kind of answer you're going to get, right? And if you Google it, there's so many things on the internet, you're like, I don't know if this is true or untrue. And if I try it on my own, maybe I might get it right, but I never know quite right if I did. You see, every problem seems to leave us in this quandary, right? Uh, what do I do? We have a world filled with self-help, self, self, self-help advice, articles that tell us how to lose weight 10 pounds in 10 days or get a, or get a date in three easy steps. But have you noticed that all this advice seems to be changing over time? No one seems to agree on what the best advice is, not even moms. One study will tell you that coconut oil will cure everything. And on the other, another study will tell you it will make you gain weight. 50 years ago, we all thought that going to college was the best thing for your future. And today, you might say, hey, you might get, jump into the, the workforce or go to tra a trade school or go to college. There are a lot of options. One person might say Michael Jordan is the GOAT. Others might say LeBron James. Our opinions change with the time and culture. I don't know about you, but I would really like to base my life around things that isn't changing instead of ideas that are always changing. And that's exactly what we find in the Word of God. You see, the, pa the pages of the Scripture are never changing, always reliable Word of God. We're going to see how Matthew 24, 35 says it. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Mm, amen. See, Jesus underscored the faithfulness and reliability of his teachings. His words will stand even after heaven and earth pass away. Jesus' words are firmer than earth's bedrock, more sound than the foundations of heaven. Christ's words are more certain than even the existence of our universe. Matthew 5.18 says it like this. Matthew 5.18. For I truly tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Oh, such a good word. We can have confidence in God's word because it will never change. His words have been the same since the beginning of time and will be the same till the end of time. God's words are older and more trustworthy than your great, 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 great grandmother's famous cookie recipe. And the, actually, there's this um, one of the oldest written recipes dates all the way back to the Mesopotamian times in 1730 BC. And they carved it in a stone tablet to pass it down. Yet God's words are even older than that great, 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 great recipe, right? It's tried and true. It's tested. We could trust it from the very beginning to the end. And while the Bible may not answer questions like how to make an apple pie or how many players or in the Major League Baseball, when you have life's biggest challenges and problems, there is nothing that even compares to the word of God. Today we're going to talk about God's words are alive, God's words are sharp, God's words are our judge. 
Let me pray for us. Father God, we give you great thanks. God, we give you thanks for moms, for laughter, for joy, um, for dads trying to make breakfast in the morning. Um, but God, we give you thanks for all things. And God, help us to receive your word. Help us to hear what you have to say. And help us to see your word as a guide. In your son's precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, we're going to jump around with a few verses, but we're primarily going to stay in Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. And we're going to see how God's word is alive. So will you read with me Hebrews 4, 12 through 13? For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Ah, such a good word. You see, his word is alive and breathing. And normally when we think about something that is alive and breathing and changing, we think about animals, we think about plants, we might even think, and humans. But do you think about God's word? See, the scripture tells us that God's word is living. It's dynamic and productive. It causes things to happen. It drives home warnings to the disobedient and promises to the believer. God's word will change things within us. When we read it, when we meditate on it, when we apply it to our lives, we are changed and the world around us is changed. The impact of God's word in our hearts is like a tree, right? So when we've planted his word in our heart, they begin to grow and take root. It becomes alive and active, and and it's looking to take root in us. I didn't really understand this until I went back to be a youth pastor at the church I grew up at. And this kid had grown up his whole life in church, and yet his faith was dead. Health issues had got him really down and depressed. His self-esteem was low. Initially, he came to my ministry out of parental obligation. We all know what that is, you know. Um, Month in and month out, he struggled to engage or even show up. But then one of my leaders shared God's truth with him. And miraculously, his heart was opened up to God. Suddenly, the student began to crave God's word My leader spent hours and hours discipling him and sharing God's word with him and helping him to understand the grander purpose of God's kingdom. This kid who initially resisted church was now leading worship in the youth ministry. He was a camp counselor and and joined our student leadership team. The word of God was alive in him. He could not contain it. He felt compelled to express it. He felt compelled to express it. Oh, it was a transformation. And First Peter 23 describes God's word like this. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. You see, we cannot experience salvation through Christ unless we allow his word to take root in our heart. We must submit to God and say, okay, God, This is your path. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust your word. You see, his words don't dissipate. They don't rust. They don't fade. They don't evaporate. His words are everlasting. And amen. And if we submit to it and pursue it and allow it to soak in, allow it to dwell in our heart, then will we become radically different? It's going to change us in a way that no one else expects. It's going to shape us even more than mom's advice or words. We're going to have a distinguishable difference. We will feel alive because the living word has taken root in our heart. In 2 Samuel 6, there's King David. It talks about how he feels about God's word, how it, how it makes him feel full of joy and love when he reads it. So let's read 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 16. Wearing a linen epnon, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. 
while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. The king, the highest ranking official, was dancing for God. The word of God had become alive in him. He was excited. He doesn't care who sees him. He's not embarrassed. He doesn't even care if they despise him because of his excitement for God's word. God's word has taken heart, root in uh, David's heart. It's alive. He is dancing for the Lord. He could not contain it. He felt compelled to express it. And you notice it says this, God's words are alive. They change us from the inside out. God's words are alive. They change us from the inside out. Hebrews 4.12 also tells us that God's words are sharp. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Have you ever had something sharp pierce your skin? Perhaps a knife or a blade, or a needle. It's brutally painful, and we cry out in pain, and we, we, it causes us to bleed. A few years ago, um, I was scrubbing a floor without gloves. I was using steel wool. Now, don't ask me why I was doing that. I went against all my mom's advice on that one, and eventually I paid the price for that one, because as I was scrubbing, one of the steel wools went through my thumb, and I screamed in agony, And I had to stop the bleeding. But shortly after, I realized I had to pull this steel wool out. I couldn't leave this in my thumb. And I couldn't grab it. And I'm not going to urgent care. I'll tell you, I do not like hospitals at all. So I was like, nope, not going to do this. You know what I do? I grabbed my pocket knife and I carved a bigger hole in my thumb in order to pull that steel wool slowly out. (laughs) And I clenched my teeth. So I wouldn't say every bad word that was coming through my mind at that time. And after I removed that steel wool from my thumb, I then bandaged it up. And as painful as that was, the scriptures say that God's word is sharper than that. Hebrews 4.12 says it can cut through soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Soul and spirit, joints and marrow. In other words, things that are supposed to be joined together... God's word can pierce. Things that are impossible to separate, God's word can cut through. That we would need the incisiveness of a surgeon's knife, God's word can cut through. It penetrates to the core of our moral and spiritual life. It discerns what is within us, both good and evil. Revelations 2.16 says it like this. Revelations 2.16. Repent. Therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Have you ever heard the phrase sharp words? Typically, when we think about that phrase, we think about words that hurt us or harm us or do damage to us, right? When someone's sharp to us, we're like, man, (laughs) you're being so mean to me, right? But that's not what the scripture is talking about here. You see, I don't want you to think about God's words as a harmful weapon, but more like a surgeon's scalpel. You see, we have these, we have bad things that we wish that we didn't have that were part of us, or negative thoughts, maybe a bad habit, or a sin, or an emotion, or a way of thinking that we know that shouldn't be there, but we can't get out on our own. We can't get rid of them. But as much as we might try, it seems like This habit keeps coming back. This bad behavior keeps coming back. These words keep coming back. These negative thoughts keep coming back. But that's where the word of God comes in. When the Bible says the word of God is sharp and penetrating, it's not talking about the way, it's talking about the way that God cuts straight to our hearts. Not from harm, but for healing. Not for harm, but for healing. God's words are sharp. He doesn't beat around the bush. It's not some marshmallow fluff recipe. His words 
tell us the truth, and sometimes it really hurts. His words can cut so deep, they're able to speak to the darkest, most secret part of our heart. And just like you would trust a surgeon to stitch you up, the steady hand of a surgeon, you can trust the steady hand of God and his word to show you the truth. Even when the truth is hard to hear. God's words are sharp. And in your notes it says they pierce the deepest, most secret parts of our heart. They pierce the deepest, most secret parts of our heart. God's word not only pierces the heart, Hebrews 4.12 says, but God judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25 says it like this. 1 Corinthians 14, 24 through 25. Read it with me. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. As the secrets of their hearts are laid bare, so they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Such a good word. I know oftentimes we think of the word judge and we think of that has a bad reputation because when we think of judgment, we think about how people are looking at our outward appearances and judging our values and our character. If a person is tall, good-looking, well-built, then typically society says we admire them and respect them and we might even put them in leadership. But God has this unique ability to look inside a person. God knows the true character of an individual and looks at our hearts. You see, in in 1 Samuel 16, the time had come for Samuel to go to the son of Jesse's house in Bethlehem to anoint Israel's next king. Samuel was a Levite, a prophet, a judge in the Bible. He was a highly revered man of God. And even this man who was so faithful to God judged wrongly. You see, he looked at Jesse's oldest son, Elab, and and Samuel was impressed with what he saw. He was tall, good-looking, well-built. And Samuel says, surely this is the man that God wants to anoint. Read with me 1 Samuel 16, 7, and we'll see how God responds. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, the previous king, Saul, was tall and handsome. So naturally, Samuel, the prophet, thought God wanted to anoint someone like that. Let me ask you this. Have you ever judged someone because of their outward appearance? I know I have, and more than I wish to admit. And this is what God is calling out. Elab is tall and handsome and well-built, like Saul, the previous king, but Saul's heart was corrupt. David, on the other hand, was imperfect but faithful. You see, even though Samuel misjudged Elab and David, I don't know that judging is always a bad thing, right? When we wake up in the morning we look at ourselves in the mirror to make sure we don't have stains on our shirt or, or messy hair. Um, and uh, we see what is good or bad or what needs to be corrected. Or even if we have food in our teeth, right? In the same way, God's, God's word is a mirror to our heart. It shows us who we are and whose we are. You see, Saul was the anointed king who allowed the perceptions of the world to shape him. His heart had become corrupt. His heart was exposed, and he forgot whose he was. Whose he was? He was God's anointed. Have you ever forgot whose you were? You're like, ah, why am I doing all these bad things? And then you go, ah, I'm actually a child of God, the beloved child of God. And God desired better for his people. David at the time was a lowly shepherd. He wasn't the smartest or the fastest or even the best looking. He was a humble servant of God. He decided more than anything to know God. 
And even though Samuel misjudged the, God's anointed, it's hard to blame him because appearance can be deceiving. The outward appearances don't reveal what a heart is like. It doesn't show a person's character or value or whether we have integrity or faithful. Outward qualities, by definition, are superficial. Moral and spiritual considerations are far more important to God. God looks at the heart. God is looking at your heart. Sure, sometimes when God looks at our heart, it shows our flaws. But unlike this world, God doesn't leave us there. God does not tear us down or destroy us. He doesn't want to embarrass us or belittle us. But instead, God wants to create a new creation to transform us. God wants to create a new creation to transform us. God calls us to a new creation transformed by his power. And I'll be honest, it's uncomfortable at times. But God's judgment is exactly what we need. You see, like Samuel, we can't see what the Lord sees, so we need to lean on his wisdom. Your perception of an individual is full of deception. Your perception of an individual is full of perception. Because we have a limited understanding, whereas God is infinite. So if anyone was to judge my heart, if anyone was to judge your heart, I'm glad it's God. Because God, when God sees your heart, he sees your faithfulness, your true character, and the value of individuals. God's words are our judge. They transform us into a new creation. God's words are alive. They're sharp and they're our judge. And we should be grateful for that. We should be relieved that they are a source of wisdom. Trust me, I know that it's so easy to look everywhere else but to God for wisdom. But I'm wondering if you're tired of pursuing the world's way and next time you have a problem Maybe you look to God for guidance, to dive deep into his word. Because God's, God's word is most effective when we allow it to go deep in our hearts, to judge us and heal us. It's the kind of work that doesn't, um, that doesn't happen in just 30 seconds of either asking mom or Google, what does the Bible say about dot, dot, dot? God's word works best when we sit with it, when we wrestle with it, we remember it, and let it change us. Psalm 119, 105 says this, Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light on my path. God's word is alive. They change us from the inside out. God's word is sharp. It pierces the, the deepest, most secret parts of our heart. And God's words are our judge. It transforms us into a new creation. One of the things I am so grateful for is the way my mom taught me God's word. She impressed it upon my heart. And I want to encourage you to spend some time in God's word, to impress it upon your heart, to see what God says to you this month. And also, stitch his words to your heart by memorizing the scripture. I'm going to lift us up in just prayer. And as we do, just I want you to lift up those in your life who have impressed God's word upon your heart, who have shared his truth with you, who have been your guide through everything. Father God, we just give you great thanks and praise. You are an amazing God. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for your word, for the way you love us, the way you show us your kindness, God, the way you bless us, the way you give us wisdom and you guide us. 
Father God, the way you give us incredible people like moms, mother figures in our life to walk in the way of the Lord, to be guided by you. Father God, you are so good. And today, God, we lift up moms, stepmoms and mother figures in our life who have helped us to walk in the ways of the Lord. Father God, you are so good. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. I couldn't get out of here without giving you at least one, one little sappy video, so I got one for you for Mother's Day. So here we go. We're going to watch a quick clip um, and then close out in worship. Or not. Take that. Hey, Mom. I want to take the time today and thank you. I know, I know, you never want any thanks, but today we pause to say it. The gift you've given us, this family, it's something that lasts way beyond a holiday or a birthday or even a lifetime. You can't wrap it in the pretty paper you always seem to find for us. This is different, and I think it's because you're different. I've watched you love, well, people who were hard to love in a family that didn't always stay tidy or always love in return. That's love that can't be contained. It spills into all the other generations. You have given me gifts I can't repay. You hand out grace without asking for any back and mercy when you have nothing to gain. Quiet strength in the loudest moments. You love me when I'm too busy to notice. But I've heard your wise words when you didn't think I listened. And don't think I haven't noticed that old worn out Bible of yours. I am reminded constantly of your sincere faith. I can't imagine the prayers you prayed for all of us. All the oil you burned through long midnights. I'm starting to understand what it means to have a mom heart. I know I can be the kind of mom I want to be. Because of you. Thank you everything. Your life has changed mine. <laughs>